بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم peace be with you we will start the afternoon off with a recitation from the holy quran by muazzin musa of the great masjid masjid a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا أقسم بهذا البلد وأنت حل بهذا البلد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا أقسم بهذا البلد وأنت حل خلقنا الإنسان في كبد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا خلقنا الإنسان في كبد يحسب أن لن يقدر عليه أحد يحسب أن لن يقدر عليه أحد يقول أهلقت مالا لبدا يحسب أن لم يره أحد ألم نجعل له عينين ولسانا وشفتين وهديناه النجدين
ألم نجعل له عينين ولسانا وشفتين وهديناه النجدين فلق تحم العقبة وما أدراك ما العقبة ألم نجعل له عينين ولسانا وشفتين وهديناه النجدين فلق تحم العقبة وما أدراك ما العقبة ألم نجعل له عينين ولسانا وشفتين وهديناه النجدين فلق تحم العقبة وما أدراك ما العقبة صدق الله العظيم صدق الله العظيم جزاك الله موسى Respected elders, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters It is a privilege and an honor for me to welcome you to this afternoon's lecture by Ahmad Didat entitled What is Wisdom? Mr. Didat, as most of you will agree, is no stranger to us all he is a very prominent speaker, he is well known locally as well as internationally. He is also an author of several publications including The Choice, which is available at the door. My name is Isa Koning and I happen to be one of the many, many souls who have been guided to the path of Islam by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the works of Mr. Ahmadidat. In the short period of time that I have known him, I have come to love and respect him more like an uncle or a grandfather. The knowledge that I have gained uh, through Mr. Didat, I do believe to be invaluable. The fact that Mr. Didat is simultaneously loved and hated in many circles is not something which surprises me. Most every person who has stood up for truth and spoken out against falsehood uh, throughout history has inevitably found himself in this position. Nevertheless, it does sadden me to see it enacted before my very eyes. Before I do call upon Mr. Didat to deliver his lecture, I would like to share with you these few words. To all those who are sincerely seeking truth, a sincere search for truth has to be one which is objective and free of any kind of prejudice. One has to be willing to drop the crutches of flippancy and prejudice and be willing to first analyze one's own belief. This lecture, like the many others by Mr. Didat, is aimed at this specific group of people, those who are sincere, sincerely seeking the Sirat al-Mustaqim. As to those who prefer the comfort of prejudice, this will probably only increase that disease. Nevertheless, if only one person benefits from this lecture, then I do believe our efforts, inshallah, are not in vain. At the end of the lecture, you will be availed of the opportunity of putting questions to Mr. Didat. There are a few rules, but I will notify you further at the time. Jazakallah. Auzu billahi min shaitan rajim بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أدعو إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعزة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن إن ربك هو أعلم بمن ضل سبيله وهو أعلم بالمتدين صدق الله صدق الله المرزيم ما دي يا بريدرين 
this ayah I read to you, I first learnt it about 45 years ago. About 45 years ago, me with some other friends, like-minded people, had attended a lecture in the Pine Street Madrasa Hall. And the lecturer suggested that if you, telling the audience, if you memorize half a dozen different verses from the Quran with their meaning, you will shine in any gathering. Wherever you are, Allah's Kalam acts as an ornament, it acts as a weapon of attack and defense. From every point of view, different verses, just memorize them and it will hold you in good stead. I and a friend, Mr. Suleiman said, he passed away. He had a shop in 144 Queen Street. We are now in 124 IPCI. He was at 144 Queen Street. We came to an agreement. I said, Suleiman, if you come across an ayah that tickles you, write it down and give it to me. Same thing, if I come across an ayah that tickles me, you know, I get fascinated with it. I want to play with it. I will write it and give it to you. You memorize that and I will memorize what you give me. That's the game we are going to play now. Memorizing verses. So this verse I read to you is the first verse he wrote and gave it to me about 45 years ago on a piece of paper and I memorized it. <coughs> and we made this as a logo on the IPCI letterhead. So invite all to the ways of the Lord with wisdom and with beautiful preaching. We made that a logo on the IPCI letter, even today. It's there. So, and this verse is so common. Our Muslim brothers, they know this word. And they're always using this. Not to teach people how to do dawah with hikmah, but trying to correct the person. This morning, this morning, I was at that Felicia Mobuzo show. I was a participant there. While going to, to before, before going on to the stage, two Muslim, two Muslim brothers, they quoted me this, ki, you know, hikmat se kam lena. You know, bil hikmati. You know what, what, what's, the, what, what's the message? In other words, the guy is saying, don't, he says, don't, you know, spoil the show. If you have the chance, you tell me now, what is this hikmah? Hmm? Show me, show me hikmah. No, no, every time a man is asking me, he's quoting me this ayah, he's implying that you, Mr. Didat, are not using hikmah. Ask him, what is hikmah? He says, wisdom. I said, that's the translation. I want you to show me wisdom. How? How do you implement these words? Mm -hmm. Bankrupt. But now, before we get into bil hikmah, I said, there are things that we are to avoid. Things we are to avoid in Dawa. And it's a very powerful ayah in the Holy Quran, which instructs us things not to do, the way not to do. I start with that. See, Sheikh Saadi Rahmatullah one of our great philosopher poets, people asked him, he says, Ya Sheikh Saadi, where did you learn all your good manners from? Very, very cultured, mannered person. Where did you learn all your good manners from? He said, I learned it from the unmannerly. I learned this good manners from the guys who got no manners. He said, how can you learn good manners from a guy who's got no manners? He says, you see, everything that the other guy did, which I didn't like, I said, no, I won't do that. Eliminate from my life. You behave like this, this is how you talk? Brawling, shouting, and pushing things down to you. Mm, I won't do that. Everything I see in somebody that I don't like, I said, I won't do that. I won't do that. I just eliminated all those shortcomings that people have, and I am what I am. So, getting rid of. And we in Islam, when a person accepts Islam, we are born Muslim, most of us, I take it, we are all Muslims. But when a person accepts Islam, we make him to read the Shahada. The kalima. And how does it start? How does the kalima start? La ilaha. You start with la. 
No es la. No. There is no ilaha. There is no object of worship. Illallah, except Allah. The most powerful word in any language. La. No. Nye. Ta. In any language, this word no is a very, very most powerful word in every language on earth. Once a person says no, you have to move heaven and earth to make him to say yes. Do you know that? In salesmanship they teach us. See to it that when you go to sell something to the shopkeeper, the traveling salesman, don't allow that guy to say no. Don't reach that. Let him, let him not reach that stage. Once he says no, now to persuade him to say yes, you want to marry somebody's daughter. Hmm? And as soon as they look, I want to marry you, he says no. Finish. How, how are you going to make him to change now? You have to move heaven and earth. So it's a very, very powerful word and Allah begins instructing us. He says, Wala, 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 and don't. Wala tu jadilu ahlal kitabi illa billati hiya ahsa. And I had the good fortune to say, people throwing things at me. So I have to learn to find out how to defend myself with Allah's kalam. So I learned this ayah as well. And a beautiful message was given to me. It was about six months ago. It was winter time. Maghrib was around five o'clock. So I get a telephone call from Mr. Babu Jadwat. Ideals, ideals. You know, ideal corner, ideal clothing people, ideal. That ideal corner. There were so many ideal shops. Chadwats. So he phones me, he says, Uncle, there is a group of six Saudis coming along and I want you to be at the airport welcoming these people. So the natural excuse, you know, I said, look man, I live on the north coast. I have to pass, go to the south coast, to the airport, and then 8 o'clock at night, and then you take me home, he says, for supper. He'll finish at 11, 12 o'clock. I said, look, leave me out. Next day, I said, that group is visiting my office, so I'll meet them. He says, no, I need you. I said, okay, if you need me, I'll be there. So I was there. Eight o'clock, the people arrived. Dr. Ahmad Tutunji, a man who had opened Saudi Arabia to me, the Imam of the Ar-Raji Masjid. Ar-Raji is a very rich man. He's got banks in Saudi Arabia. He's built a masjid in Riyadh called Ar-Raji Masjid, Imam of that masjid, and the son of Ar-Raji Bank, and three other Saudis. So we met them, welcomed them, and went to Mr. Babu Jadwal's house somewhere in Sydney. Big house, big palace. We went there. And when we arrived there, there were about 50 people there. Because it was dinner. Dinner. If there was dinner or lunch here, you know, we would have had the hall filled. No, I, you see. So there were about 50 people there. The guests, the visitors, they said, you see, we haven't made our Maghrib and our Isha yet. I took it that bulk of the people must have done their Maghrib and Isha. The Muslims, all Muslims. So I said, no, I'll also join you. So I joined the people for Maghrib and Isha. After making wudu and joining them, I said, Allahu Akbar for Maghrib. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I already did Maghrib. It was around five o'clock Maghrib. So in my mind, from five to eight to nine, it looked like I did Asar. But what can I do? So I remained behind the Imam and you are allowed in Islam. You can carry on, you can make your niya for any Salah behind the Imam. If there's a Jamaat standing and if you want to add two more of your own, you can make any niya and join behind the Imam. So I joined behind the Imam with that Saudi group. In the second rakat of Maghrib, the Imam is reading. وَلَا تُجَادِلُوا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنٍ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْهُمْ وَكُلُوا آمَنَّا بِالَّذِي أُنْزِلَ إِلَيْنَا وَأُنْزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ وَإِلَهُنَا وَإِلَهُكُمْ وَاحِدٌ وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ سَمِيَ اللَّهُ لِمَنْ هَمِدَ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ and we finish the next rakat finish the maghrib then did isha they did two I did four finish that now all the surahs he has been reading it was like water on duck's back I heard and I didn't hear I couldn't remember a thing there are 6,000 verses in the Quran and if an Imam reads it 
would you remember what he's reading what he's reading unless you have the quran or maybe it's some something special to do with that ayah that the man is reading as a message for you <clears throat> no bulk of all the verses he read were like water on duck's back it just flowed away but this verse in the second rakat made an impression on my mind you know why because i knew the meaning i knew the meaning of the verse so huh? hey this man is talking to me he's addressing me this targeting me so after salat i want to get near to him to ask him i said why did you read that ayah they had no chance so we sat down to eat across the table from me is dr ahmed tutunji and this imam is about four or five people away from there so i am asking dr tutunji this man doesn't know english and i don't know arabic so i'm asking dr tutunji please ask the imam confirm it with him whether this is what he read wala tujadilu ahlal kitabi illa billati hi ahsan as ask him so dr tutunji asked the man did you this verses did you read he said yes i said ask him why he said the imam replied he said i was thinking of you me when he was reading so i said ask him why again he repeated he says i was thinking of you mr didat when i was reading actually he's trying to say that i was trying to address you in that that's the purpose of salat purpose of salat is to give us instructions guidance that's the purpose of salat tarawi we went through that whole month it was a refresher course for muslims to remember every verse of the quran which you haven't got the time to read at least once in a year in one month at least you'll go through browse brush through that's the purpose of salat so he said i was thinking of you so i'm asking him as a dik did sheikh al muhammad al uthaymin the uh, mufti the grand mufti of saudi arabia i said did he speak to you about this for you to address me with this verse directing that verse to me did sheikh muhammad al uthaymin the grand mufti of saudi arabia did he speak to you about this he says no he said why because that's the one learned man to another suppose i said i did speak to him about this i spoke to him about this the grand mufti of saudi arabia i spoke to him about this so maybe one learned man to another he said you know that didat fellow that hindi guy was here and he was asking me about this verse sharing sharing the thoughts he says, and this is what i told him and this is what he told me so now he's got an opportunity to rehearse it to me he said what did you tell him what did you tell him about this verse but we had no chance then next day he came to the office two hours and we got no chance then i went to riyadh i wanted to get to him but i couldn't get to him i wanted to share with him what did i talk to sheikh muhammad al uthaymin the grand mufti of saudi arabia on one of my previous visits i go to that country muslim country saudi arabia and i happened to be in the area where this sheikh is buraida buraida is the name of the place so uh, people took me to meet him so i went and met him and i have a habit you see if i come across something that makes me think i want to see now what is your opinion what is your views how do you see this so i presented this verse to the sheikh the grand mufti of saudi arabia through an interpreter i said ask the sheikh allah says wala tujadilu ahlal kitabi illa billati hiya ahsan and don't argue don't la la don't argue don't debate don't dispute with the ahlal kitab meaning the jews and the christians illa except billati hiya ahsan except in ways better than mere disputation so i said ya shaykh i want you to tell me what we are not to do how not to do and how to do that's all don't argue don't debate don't dispute with the jews and the christians except in ways better than mere disputation i want you to give me a tafsir a commentary an explanation of this verse so he gave an explanation i said no i don't accept he was trying to justify it. 
he's a learned man. He can't say, look, I don't know. So he gave another explanation. I said, no, I don't accept. Now he had the humility. A Hindi alim or a Pakistani alim would have asked, hey, do you know Arabic? Hey, which Darwin room you went to? No, this man doesn't do that. I said, I don't accept your explanation. I mean, it's not fitting. Again, I said, I don't accept your explanation. It is not fitting. I said, look, let me make it easy for you. Look, what I really want from you. I said, you see, my society is a trust. You know, heard about IPCI. We have seven trustees. And when we have a meeting, we gather around a table. My secretary, Mr. Vanka, you know, Mr. Vanka. So he sits around the table like everybody else, but he's got his elbow on the table and his hand under his, his chin. That's how he sits and he's listening, all attentive. To, and when his turn comes to speak, he's still got his hand there and the elbow on the table and he speaks. So I said, Glamsan! He was 10 years my junior. You see? I treat him like a young brother. Hey, Glamsan, put your hand down. Put down your hands. Now talk. Means, you see, when you're talking like this, you mean well, but you're mumbling. The words are getting mumbled. You know, they're not coming out clearly. So, put your hand down. Now talk. So that's what I mean. Not like this, but like that. I gave another example. I gave another example to the Saudi who was asking me. I said, you see, what I'm telling you is, don't do like the way you are doing, but do like what I show you. So you people, when you eat rice, this is how you eat. Do you know that? The Tamils and the Telugus, that's how they eat. I said, look, you see, I said, no, don't eat like that. Look like this. Look, 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 see how I eat. Mm -hmm. See, see how nice it goes. Can you see? They're not used to. When they're not used to, they're used to only seeing the fathers doing like that, grabbing the rice and, and making a laddu of that and eating. I said, no, don't do like that, but do like this. The Chinese might tell, hey, what the hell you people dirtying your hands? Look, see how I do it with a chopstick. Right? He has a right. The Chinese has a right to tell you, look, eat like this, how neat and clean. You, we have a right to tell the, the our Tamil fellow countrymen, if you see them eating, he said, no, no, not like that. See how I eat? See? You have a right. So I said, no, not like this, but like that. Show me. He says, no, you show me. The Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia. He says, no, you show me. So I had my bag of tricks with me, my satchel. So I took out these two books, these two books, the Quran and the Bible. So I said, you see what Allah is telling you? See, the Muslim has got the Quran in his hand. And he's telling the Christian that this is Allah's Kalam. This is the word of God. Right? He said, right. The Christian says, this is the word of God. Right? He said, right. The Muslim says, this is Allah's Kalam. The Christian says, this is Allah's Kalam. The Christian says, the Quran is not the word of God. So what do you say? You say, the Bible is not the word of God. Right? It's right. The Christian says, you Muslims will go to hell. You Muslims will go to hell. Allah is telling us in the Quran. So, when they say, لَنْ يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُدًا أَبْنَ سَارَةً That you Muslims will never, never enter Jannah. There is no heaven for you. إِلَّا except مَنْ كَانَ هُدًا أَبْنَ سَارَةً The Yahudi says, unless you become a Yahudi, no Jannah for you. The Christian says, unless you become a Christian, no Jannah for you. So what do we say? We say, you Christians will go to hell. He says, you will go to hell. We say, you will go to hell. Mm -hmm. Allah says, don't talk like that. Don't talk like that. Talk better than that. So how do you talk better than that? So Allah tells you, Invite all to the ways of thy Lord with wisdom. And beautiful preaching. And reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Where is this wisdom to be found? Everybody talks about wisdom, wisdom, hikmah, hikmah, hikmah. Wisdom. Where do you find hikmah? I say, you go to the Kitabul Hakim. The Kitabul Hikmah. One of the titles of the Quran in the Quran is Al-Hikmah. Al-Nur, Al-Furqan, Al-Kitab. 
At-Tanzil. There are about 40 different names, titles given to the Quran in the Quran. One of them is Hikmah. Kitabul Hikmah. Wisdom. It's the book of wisdom. You go to the book of wisdom. But people apply a test. Every Muslim who uses that ayah, he's using it as a test to test you, to tell you you're not using hikmah. You're not using hikmah. And the test is, the test they use is that you see, Mr. D, that you are creating provocation. You are provoking people. That's not hikmah. In Hikmah, man, you must not create any provocation. People must lap it up. Mm -hmm. Everything you say, they must agree. Sweet, beautiful, talk. You know. That's the way do you find that example. This ayah, you are quoting me, my brother. Udu ila sabili rabbi kabil hikmati. It is in Surah Nahal. Surah Nahal. Where do you find Surah Nahal? In an encyclopedia like this. Very difficult. There are 114 surahs. Are you going to start paging through? Look for Nahal. Nahal. Out of 114, are you going to start paging through? And maybe you just missed it. And you start again. You got the time. You have the time for that. Who has the time? Nobody. So, I said, if you have a translation like this, at the back of this volume, there is an index, very comprehensive index. Look for Nahal. I said Surah Nahal. So, N-A-H-L, you look for Nahal and you find chapter 16. Open 16. Easy to find because every page is numbered. 16, 16. Ah, you got it. I said ayah number 125. Very easy to find. 125. Every ayah is numbered. Found it? MashaAllah. Read it now. But I said, you see, every time this verse is being read in the Orient Hall on the 11th of, mashallah, on the 11th of December, 11th of December, a meeting was organized by 31, 31, 31 Muslim bodies and societies. They organized a meeting to convene a meeting. This meeting was convened by Mr. Isa Kuni, one-man job. This was a one-man job. Whether you're happy with it or not, it's a one-man job. 31 bodies and societies, organizations, Jamita Ulama, Muslim Youth Movement, shh, you name them. 31 Muslim bodies and societies, they organized a meeting to tell people how to do dawah and how not to do dawah. Not like Didat. You don't do like Didat. We show you hikmah. And they had the meeting. Three Allamas, Alims, Maulanas, and one politician, businessman. And the Qari, he read this verse. He started the proceedings with this verse. Bismillahir Rahmanir. Udu ila sabili rabbi kabil hikmati wal mawizat al hasanati. And he gave the translation. Giving the cue to the speakers, this is what we want you to speak, man. Tell the people about hikmah. Not the way Ahmad Diyadad is doing, but what is real hikmah. Show them, teach them. And there were Hindus on the stage. No Muslim meeting. How many Hindus here? No, they're welcome. Christians, they're welcome, Allah. They're all welcome in my meetings. But the leading like the giants of Hinduism were on the stage. Ra Raj Bansi, heard the name? Parliamentarian, he's on the stage. Ram Maharaj of the Hindu Mahasabha is on the stage. Mr. Lakhani, an old businessman on the stage. And other giants of Hinduism are on the stage. What did they come there for? They want to know the Quranic message? Huh? To come and listen to your Maulwis? Why would the Hindus come? No, because on Sunday it was advertised that tomorrow at the audience hall there will be a Didat bashing. They're going to bash Didat. So the Hindus turned up. They want to see how Didat gets bashed up. But you know, Allah has blessed me so much, Allah. That I sit in Verlam. I'm sitting in Verlam. I didn't go. They didn't invite me. Because if they invited me and if they had said anything which was uncalled for, I would have stood up and said, excuse me, Maulana Sahib, you know, this is not appropriate, your translation or your message is not right. 
you know, I am capable of doing that. They knew that. So they don't invite me. So it's all right. But from Verulam, 25 kilometers away, in my house, I'm controlling the meeting. Did you know that? You can't believe it. This old man, he's a wali, Allah wala. You know Allah wala? God. <laughs> from Verulam, I say, hey, don't you take my name. No, I didn't shout. I didn't shout. In my mind, don't take my name. Nobody ever mentioned my name in the whole meeting. I said, don't take the name IPCI. You understand? Don't take the name IPCI. Don't take the word from Hinduism to Islam. The type. Don't mention that. And nobody mentions it. Can you believe it? The meeting is called for that. The meeting is called for that. For Ahmad Didat and his type guy from Hinduism to Islam. And you dare not mention my name. You dare not mention the name IPCI. And you dare not mention the name of the type. What kind of meeting is this? Huh? That is a wali. You have to become my murid. <laughs> At the end of the meeting, a Hindu stands up. He wants to ask questions. He has a right. Wallah. You see, my tapes, there are about over 80 tapes, video tapes. Every tape ends with a question and answer. Every tape. We don't gag people. So you listen to me, take it for, push things down your throat and say, now go. I've got no time now. I'm busy. No, we don't do that. We give you a fighting chance to say, Mr. D, that, you know, this was not called for, or this was, you made a mistake here, this was not right, but we have a counter answer to that. I give you the chance, fighting chance. Anybody, everybody. They said, no, the chairman says, no questions. Look, it, the Hindus are there. Why did they come there? They want satisfaction. No questions. They say, if you have any question, you write it and you send it to the Alims. And they will reply from home. You got the time to do that? Hmm? You are worked up. You want to know what is this meeting all about? You called us to come here and we came. And you don't take the name Ahmad Didat, IPCI or the tape from Hinduism and Islam. What kind of a meeting is this? It's a hoax. And 31 bodies and societies got together to organize this meeting. 31. I said, you see, it was an opportunity. Wallah. It was a grand opportunity. For the islands to demonstrate, they said, look, our Hindu brothers are here. They're sitting on the stage. And I want the Maulana to explain to them, invite them to Islam. Bil Hikmati. That's what the Quran says. Bil Hikmati. This is Hikmah, my son. See, talk like this. This is how you must talk, not like Ahmad Didat. This is how to talk to them. One Molvi, another Molvi comes along. He said, look, this is how we must talk to them. And the third Molvi comes along. He said, this is how we talk to them. That is the purpose of the meeting. It's an opportunity of a lifetime. I'm going to tell you how to talk to the Christians. And we got Christians on the stage. And I don't say one word. I don't say one word about their beliefs that you see they, our Christian brothers, they believe in the original sin. That, you know, sin entered the world. Adam al -Islam made a mistake and for that they were kicked out. And so sin entered the world and everybody is a sinner and everybody goes to hell, Jahannam, unless somebody dies for your sins. So if you don't believe that Christ died for your sins, you go to hell. Now mind your salat five times a day or fifty times a day, your hajj and your umrah and your fasting, all is all rubbish, is garbage, you all go to hell. The only way for you to get Jannah is to believe in the blood of the Lord Jesus, that he died for your sins. I have to tell them that. In the house of Islam, what do we think about that? They say that Jesus is God. In the house of Islam, you know the reasons we said no, Jesus is not God. In the house of Islam, we say Christ was not crucified. That's all the teachings of Islam. We have to tell them in the most sweet diplomatic manner that I can. That's the purpose. The people are there waiting. And you don't touch the subject at all. You're telling the Muslim, be nice, be kind, good words, sweet words. Use the words, man, talk to them. How to use those nice, sweet words? Hmm. Everybody starts with, I have 125. I'm telling people. I'm asking. That the verses you are reading, Udu la sabili rabbi kabil hikmati, is ayah 125. In every Quran, it's the same. Ayah 125. I said, this Ruku, where does it start? The Ruku. Ruku, the section. 
The same Tara we use a ruku, ruku, ruku for one rakat, one rakat, one rakat. Do you know how many rukus in Surah Nahal? I'm asking the Hafiz. I remember the Hafiz. I said, how many rukus in Surah Nahal? He doesn't know. No, no, that's not his training. He was taught from Siparas. This Sipara do that Sipara. He remembers that way. I said, Surah Nahal. I have to give him a start. He would do less, ah, then he can continue. If I give him a start, he can continue. I said, now how does this ruku start? The ruku to start that section. And the 16th ruku, in the 16th surah, is the 16th ruku, so you can't forget. It starts. Inna Ibrahim, that's how it starts. Nobody reads it. Nobody reads it. I'm telling you, you never get in your life. Any Qari starting with Inna Ibrahim, Kana Ummatan, Qanita Lillahi Hanifa, Walam Yaku Minal Mushrikeen. He'll start. Verse 125, Udu Ila Sabi Li Rabbika Bil Hikmati, Wal Mawizat Al Hasanati Wajal. Nobody starts at the section where it starts. And here is a fitting message for the Mushriks. That, that, that section itself is a fitting message to Father. If you started with that, the Qari, if you only read the translation, it would be a message. Say, Inna Ibrahima, most certainly Ibrahim, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Kana ummatan, he is a model for you. Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah says, he is a model for you. He is an example for you. He is a pattern for you to follow. He is the flagship of Islam, of Wahdaniyat. He is the vanguard of Tawheed, in the forefront of Tawheed, belief in the unity of God. And he is the flagship. You know, in the flagship, in the fleet, when it goes out to war, in the flagship, the admiral, the admiral, he is the head, he is the flagship, in which the admiral is. And you know, admiral is Arabic. Do you know that? The word admiral is an Arabic word. It says Amirul Bahar, means the commander of the sea. Admiral is uh, Amirul Bahar. The admiral of the fleet he is in the flagship. Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam is your flagship. He is the vanguard of Islam. And follow him. Inna Ibrahim kana ummatan qanita lillahi hanifa wa lam yakum minal mushrikeen. And he was one devoutly obedient to Allah and he was not one who joined other gods with Allah that's the message he is the one who didn't join anybody with Allah Allah wa ta'ala sharik no associate no partners that's his message that's ayah number 120 120 just jump to 123 come to 123 before coming to 125 120 says Ibrahim is a model for you that you must follow and he was an upright person and he was not of the mushriks verse 123 Allah speaks to our Nabi addressing him now thus we are revealing this to you the Quran we are sending this to you in like manner the way it was given to Ibrahim and the prophets now we are giving so you follow him. You follow him. Very strong word of command. Follow him. Millata Ibrahim Hanifa of the, the, the ways of Ibrahim, the upright. Wamakana min al mushrikin. Again, he was not of the mushrik. He is not one who associates anybody with Allah. Now comes along. Allah says Ibrahim is an example for you, model for you. Telling one Nabi, he is a model for you, you follow him. Did he or didn't he follow? Our oh, Nabi Karim. I want to know, you think he didn't follow? Allah is commanding, you follow him. Did he or didn't he follow? Our oh, Nabi is the living Quran, he lived the Quran. Hazrat Aisha Siddiqua was asked about him. He said he was the living Quran. He was the walking Quran. Allah says, follow him. He must have followed him. How do you follow him? Example is given to you in the Quran. Allah is giving the example. What did Ibrahim do that you must do likewise? You go to Surah Maryam and you find an example. Allah says, 
Vaskur fil kitab Ibrahima and narrate, relate in the book, in the Quran, the story of Ibrahim. Vaskur fil kitab Ibrahima innahu kana siddiqan nabiya. Miss certainly he was a siddiq, a testifier, verifier of truth, and a prophet. His testimony, his credentials. He is the man of haq and he is a prophet. Innahu kana siddiqan nabiya. Is qala li abihi and behold he said to his father ya abati oh my father eh hamare abba jaan oh my daddy ya abati inni ya abati lima ta'budu ma la yasma'u wa la yufsiru wa la yughni anka shay'a says oh my father why was she be that which can neither hear no see and can profit you nothing paraphrased he said, oh my father, Allah has given you ears to hear. You can hear this God that you're worshipping, poor thing, it can't even hear. Oh my father, Allah has given you sight, you can see. Why are you following one who poor thing can't see? In this poor God, if a fly sits in his eyes and is about to shit in the eye, this God can't even blink to chase the fly away. Why would you worship that, my father? Oh my father, Ayya Bajan. In Urdu, so oh, Bajan, with respect, Atra seven. Why? Do, and this thing can neither profit you, can profit you nothing. Yabati again, continuation. Oh my father, again. Yabati inni kajani min alulmi malam yutika fatnu walam yatika min alulmi malam yutika fatnu walam yatika. Malam yatika fattabi ani. So, telling the father, then follow me. Knowledge has come to me, which has not reached you. So, oh my father, follow me, and I will show you a way that is even and straight. Follow me. And again, ya abati, ya abati. La shaitan. Do not worship shaitan. Don't follow shaitan. Inna shaitan ali rahman yasiya because shaitan is ungrateful to Allah most merciful. Again, ya abati, O oh my father, inni akhafu an yamasaka azabun min ar rahmani li takuna li shaitani waliya. So, O oh my father, I fear, inni akhafu, I fear lest some harm come to you, that you become to shaitan a friend four times. Every ayah. Ya abati, O oh my father. 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 Can you can you do better than that? I I want to know you Alim Allah ask could you have done better than that? Huh? Can you talk better than that to your father who's a mushrik? Can you address him any better than that? Ki oh my father. Oh my father. Oh my father. Oh my father. <laughs> How does the father react? Ibrahim. Say, Ibrahim, you hate my gods? Hmm? You hate my gods? Get out of my sight for a good long while, otherwise I'll stone you to death. I'll stone you to death. Get out of my sight. Rubbish! The son is talking to the, it's a beautiful son talking to the father. Oh my father, oh my father, oh my father, oh my father. And the father reacts, hey you! Get out of my sight. Get out of my sight. Because I'll stone you to death. Why? Ibrahim al didn't know how to talk. Hmm? You can talk better than that. You would have. Eh? No? Yes, yes. You know, Udu will ask Rabbi Kabil Hikmat. You would have talked better. Your Hikmah. You know better Hikmat than that. Then Ibrahim al Salam, Allah says he's the model for you. He's telling our Nabi, follow him. And our Nabi followed him. And what did he get in return? He followed him. Bil Hikmat. And his people reacted against him. For 13 years he suffered at their hands. He had to flee for his life from Makkah to Medina. You know that? The Sahabas had to make two hijras to Abyssinia. Did you know that? You know why? Because he didn't know how to talk. If you were a Sahaba, you would have reminded our Nabi, Ya Rasulullah. You know, Allah says, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati. You know, do his work with hikmah. Would you have told him that? In other words, he doesn't know hikmah. You know hikmah. You know hikmah. You make me angry. 
That's what you're implying, that you know hikmah. Ibrahim al Islam didn't know hikmah, he created reaction. Our Nabi created reaction. The mushriks of Makkah wanted to kill him. The Jews wanted to kill him. The Christians wanted to kill him. The Munafis wanted to kill him. Four different groups of people, every group wanted to destroy the man. You know why? Because he didn't know hikmah. Come, come, tell me now. Because if this is your test, reaction, if that is the test, then all the prophets had failed miserably. All. Hazrat Isa Islam failed. Our Nabi failed. You know that? If this said no reaction, the Jews reacted against Jesus. They made an attempt on his life. No. Huh? Because if he knew Hikmah, he, there would be no reaction. Hazrat Ibrahim Islam created reaction. If he knew Hikmah, he would have created reaction. Our Nabi, if he knew Hikmah, he wouldn't have created reaction. That's your test. That's your test. No. This is the nature of truth and falsehood. Allah says in the Quran, Bal nakzifu bil al batil. When truth is hold against, heard against falsehood, it knocks out his brains. And when your brain is knocked out, how do you behave? I want to know. When your brain is knocked out, how do you behave? Sane. Sanity. With reason. Logic. Is that how you behave? When your brain is knocked out with alcohol or a punch on the, brain, on the head. Uh, how do you behave? Like a drunken guy. No? Your brain is knocked out. How do you behave? Sanity. No, reaction is not a test, my brothers. You show me, show me, come and show me how to do the job. Allah is giving me examples of it in the Quran. Say, here, follow Ibrahim. And you follow and you'll get the beating, same beating. It's a miracle. Well, it's a miracle that Ahmad Didar has been doing this job for the past 40 years. You know, from 1957, over 40 years. And in 40 years, no non-Muslim has ever touched me like this. Did you know that? And I'm talking the most controversial subjects. In the city hall, 1957, I go to the city hall and the Muslims are shivering. Subject, what the Bible says about Muhammad. Say, How can you talk this? How can you talk about the Bible? They're shitting in their pants, Muslims. I lecture in Cape Town and you're getting diarrhea here. My people are getting diarrhea here. No, Julab. Julab, yang salah lagi tahe tunggu ya. So I'm lecturing in Cape Town and you're getting julab here. What's going to happen to me that? Look, after 40 years, most controversial subjects, Christ in Islam, is the Bible God's word? Is Jesus God? Was Christ who said most controversial subjects? In Britain, in America, in throughout the world. And no Christian has ever touched me like this yet. Nobody has thrown a rotten tomato or a rotten egg at me yet. I was assaulted once. You know by who? By Muslims. Muslims did it. I was assaulted in Newton Hague. As a guest of the Muslim Youth Movement, I had gone there to lecture there. And I got a beating. Who beat me? Muslims. Muslims. No Hindu or Christian as Jew has ever touched me yet. I must be an angel. Or I'm that, like that man. Says the man they couldn't kill. There was a program on radio. The man they couldn't kill. He seemed to have had got a shield around him. People can't see, but nobody can get near him. <laughs> That's Ahmad Didat. Alhamdulillah, Allah has looked after No, no, I'm not provocative. Wallah, I'm speaking, I'm reasoning, and the guy who's listening, although he disagrees, he can say, well, he's got a right to say what he's saying. You disagree with me, but he says, no, he's not insulted. He's putting forth his case. Said, Look, you say Jesus is God, we say he's not God. Why? You say Christ died for your sins? We said, no, he didn't. He said, why? Hmm. Coming to the point, the Sheikh, I showed him this. He said, 100%. Your way of talking, I said, now what you do? I said, it depends on the customer. Bill Hikmah. How do you talk to the people? Each according to the customer. We, the Indian Muslims, the business people. When I was a schoolboy, I left school, I went and worked in the country shops, and my fathers, our fathers, elders were saying, Jew ghara teu padiku. You know, as the customer is, that's the type of parcel you tie up for him. Jew ghara teu padiku. Depending on the customer. Right? The white man comes along, he buys, oh, a brown paper, brown paper. Brown paper, bring brown paper. The poor African buys newspaper, newspaper, we tie it up. Jew ghara teu padiku. Depending upon the customer, the parcel that you tie depends upon your customer. Now this guy, poor fellow, he doesn't mind. Newspaper. We're talking to the, the white man, he needs a brown paper, so you need a brown paper. So, according to your customer, you tie the parcels. What is he talking about? 
So start with it. The ordinary man, the fellow worker with you, who's working with you, he's working with you, talk to him nicely. Talk to everybody nicely. Assuming that the guy's good. He says, you know, you start. How do you start? With a Christian. He said, you know, we believe in Jesus. He said, what? We believe in Jesus. He says, what? He's thinking you want to carry favor with him. Hmm? He says, you know, we believe he's one of the mightiest messengers of God. He said, yeah. He said, yes. So you know we believe that Jesus was born miraculously without any male intervention which many modern day Christians including the bishops of the Anglican Church they don't believe but we believe did you know that the bishops of the Anglican Church they don't believe but we believe we believe that Jesus was the Messiah the Messiah translated Christ we believe he gave life back to the dead based in Allah and he healed those born blind and the lepers based in Allah you know what the Quran says it says no opportunity Invite him home for a cup of tea. I'm showing you how to do the job. Invite him home for a cup of tea. He says, have you seen the Quran? He says, no. He says, look, I'll show you. You know what it says about Jesus? He says, no. Open. In this one. Volume. Index. Jesus. He speaks about Jesus. First item. And the J. Jesus. First item. It says a righteous prophet. A true prophet of God. Second item. Second item. His birth. Chapter 3, verse 42 onwards. Chapter 19, verses 23 onwards. Open chapter 3. And read it to your Christian friend, your fellow countryman, your fellow worker. Take him home, man, for a cup of tea. If you can't afford a dinner, give him a cup of tea and some bhajas and some musas. And see what you can do with that. Allah. You can perform miracles. Open the book. Chapter 3, Surah Ali Imran. Imran, chapter 3. Ayah 42, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa is qalatil malaikatu ya Maryamu. So behold, the angel said, O Mary, inna Allah has tafaki, Allah has chosen thee, wa taharaki, and purified thee, wa tafaki ala nisa ala alameen, chosen thee above the women of all nations. I said, do you know, such an honor is not to be found in Mary, the mother of Jesus, even in your Bible. Did you know that? Did you know that? This honor that the Quran gives Maryam alayhi salam is not to be found in his Bible. Tell him so. It's not even in your Bible. His Holiness the Pope has written a book called Crossing the Threshold of Hope. No Muslim is likely to have this book. I'm telling you. No Muslim can. We are not a reading people. Do you know that? We don't even read newspapers. If you read the newspapers, this hall would be packed. You know that? If our people were reading, people, they would have read the newspapers. Damn it all, forget the pamphlet. If you read the newspapers, you would have come. Curiosity. Let's see, man, what this guy has to say. Curiosity. You even have got curiosity. You don't read newspapers. Bulk of us, I'm telling you, we don't even read newspapers. I see a review of this book in the Daily News. Mm -hmm. Then I said, well, what has this guy got to say? What will he say? How much is it? You know how much? Fifty-nine ninety-nine. Are you hearing? Are you guys hearing? Fifty-nine ninety-nine. If you gave sixty rands, sixty rands, you get this change, this one cent. Can you see this? If you gave sixty rands, you get one cent change for that book, two hundred and forty pages. In contrast. Hardcover, gold embossed, silk paper, silk paper, five rands. I give you 12 of this for one of this. I give you 12 of this for one of this. And the Muslim finds it expensive. He finds it expensive. I'm telling you, this is my nation. You will make me angry. Allah, you make me angry. The 60 rands less one cent. I give you six Qur'ans for the price of 60 rand and one cent change I'll give you two. 1,200 pages, 2,000 each. Six copies I give you for 60 rand and one cent change I'll give you. I give you six Qur'ans, 2,000 pages each. That's 12,000 pages as again 240 pages. For this one I give you 12,000 pages and you feel it hard. Hmm. I do. Can you imagine? Ten rands each. 
And I say, if you can't afford it, come and see me. I'll give you free. Wallah, free. You just have to come and tell me, uncle. Said, Look, I need the Quran, but I can't afford it. I want the book. I want the book. You say, did I? But I can't afford it. Wallah, I won't ask you for your bank balance. And I won't ask you how much you're earning and how you squandered your money. Mm -hmm. I'll give it to you free. But that too you can't do. You know that you're too damn proud man, too damn arrogant. I'm telling you, you are an arrogant people. Somebody offers you something for nothing, even that you can't take. How miserable can you be? How miserable can you get? I want to know. I say you know, to my sisters here, all the grown-ups, I want you to take one each free. That's for you. It's a great sacrifice on your part. Having come, you honor me, Wallah, I feel greatly honored. May Allah bless you all. Everybody gets this book. You people, five runs each. If you can't afford it, come and see me in the office. This Quran, ten runs each is available. Yes. Man, you need it. It improves your English. Wallah. This English that I'm talking, where did I get? I'm a standard six Johnny. But I'm talking, you know, where? This Quran, Wallah. This Quran did the job for me. It improved my English. Hmm? Talk, talk, talk. And then gives you an opportunity of this. Share the message. Deliver the message. Allow your children to read this. Make your children once a week, at least once a week, your son, your daughter. I said, then, then, there are you know, read it and explain to your mother. Read it and explain to your mother. Once a week, only once a week, don't be too greedy. Only once a week, after supper, hmm? ask your son. I said, read it and explain to your mother. You know what you're doing? You're making it to actively go through the mind of your child. And if you do it once a week, inshallah, the family will grow together, unite together, respect and reverence for the parents, all that you can achieve and the knowledge. The child comes to know where I can find what. Any problems, let's go to the Quran. Let's see what Allah says. Let's see what Allah says. Very comprehensive index. Whatever you want to know, go to the index. You know about marriage in Islam and the M. You know about divorce in Islam and the D. You know about heaven or hell and the H. What do you want to know? Whatever you want to know on your fingertips. And how much? 10 rands. And if you can't afford it, as they come and see me, I give you free of charge. So with these words, my dear brothers and sisters, I hope that we have learned in by something about Bil Hikmati. Hikma means to do it with wisdom. It does not mean it can't create reaction. Reaction is not a test. That's all. Reaction is not a test. Because against all the messages that mankind gives, for guidance there is always a reaction. If I tell you something that you are not involved in, you say, mashallah, mashallah. Like a country priest. I'm ending with this. You're stealing, talking about stealing. One of the commandments, ten commandments, thou shalt not steal. So he's lecturing to his congregation, says, thou shalt not steal horses. So everybody says, amen, 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 amen. So thou shalt not steal cows. He says, amen, amen. Everybody says, amen, amen. You must not steal sheep. He says, yeah, amen, amen. You must not steal chickens. He says, I mean, I mean. He says, you must not steal eggs. So one guy shouted, this guy's interfering now. He was talking about, he was just, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Extra. <laughs> Don't talk about eggs. Talk about everything else because you're not involved. You say, you say I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. But where you are present, he must say, this guy's interfering now. He's talking business now. Huh? When you talk about interest, he's talking about interest. Look, poor fellow. Let him talk about religion. Mind his own business. Let us carry on with our business, you know, whatever we do with interest. So, so when you're personally involved, you react. After about everything else, you agree. But you are a nicotine addict. I said, cigarette is very bad. You know, you're squandering money, health, and you're inflicting suffering on your old mother. She's got short breath. You know what you're doing? You're actually strangling her. Your child has got wheezing. You know what you're doing? You're suffocating your child. You're rubbish. I said, Nadi, that is interfering. You see, just keep to religion, man. Talk about Salat and Zakat and Hajj and Psalm. We are happy with him. Don't talk about cigarettes. Don't talk about interest. This is man. So when you're personally involved, this is people react. Wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Jazakallah, Mr. Leader. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now question time. Therefore, anyone who does have any questions pertinent to the topic, you're invited to come forward. The microphone here provided. There are just a few rules. Uh, please, one question at a time. And preferably, as I say, the question should be relevant to the topic and the discussion today. If you do have more than one question, you can go to the back of the queue. Anyone who does have questions, you're invited to come forward now. Mm, actually, I didn't uh, participate at the beginning. 
but I think wisdom is a big subject. So I would love to ask a question. And before that, uh, I would love to make a statement. We Muslim people believe that the Quran is the last testament. We believe as well that it, it has an answer to every problem of mankind. So could you perhaps highlight this statement to the non-Muslim people by relating it to the socio-economic and political situation of the world? That's it. Thank you. Allah says he's given to us in this Quran every type of similitude, example, guidance. So now, what is your problem? What is your problem for which you need guidance? You want to know about how to run the country? You go and ask the experts. See, every, in every field you have experts. When this statement was made, I think when Napoleon went to Egypt, and when he heard this, that the Quran has answers to all your problems, all your questions, so Napoleon said, right, call the Sheikh of al -Azhar. He said, you say, you claim that the Quran has solution to all the problems, answers to all the questions. He said, yes. So he said, my army, I want to know what amount of food that is required for a week. My army, how much meat, flour, rice, what, what I need for my army. What does your Quran say? So the Sheikh said, the Quran says, if there's anything you don't know, ask the experts. So the experts in your field who work out, you know, how many sheep and how many goats you require for this army and what amount of rice and sugar, go and ask the guys who know. What you don't know, go and ask the guy who knows. The answer is in the Quran. If you don't know, go and ask the guy who knows. So what is your problem? Come with the problem. Say, now we go and ask the experts. You want about inheritance? Uh, go and ask the experts. The law of inheritance is there, everybody is an expert. Anytime you have any kind of conflict, you go to a, a lawyer, you want a guy to be an expert in that law, to fend for you. Expert in that law, whatever is concerning you. Every lawyer is not an expert in everything, you see? No, you say look for experts, the guy in economics, the guy in criminal law, the guy in this law, everybody is an expert, go and ask the experts. Next question, any other question? One more, go ahead. I think I have to be more specific. I've been, I've, I've been asked this question, I couldn't answer properly. That's why I wanted to ask it in this debate. Actually, I've been discussing with some few Christian friends and they want to know whether or not polygamy in Islam does not create trouble in the society. See, that, that is how you see now when you ask that question. Otherwise, I would start going to how Mandela is, you know, creating this constitution and how the con I, where do I, what do I grapple with? Now you talk about the man asking you a question about polygamy, then you, I show you how to talk to him. You see, you ask me about, say, you are a non-Muslim, you know about polygamy. I said, right, look, I said, 55% of all voters in South Africa are women. Did you know that? I'm asking that guy who's questioning me, 55% of people who vote for the ANC are women. So there are more women than men. And there's a surplus of women throughout the world. The American is asking me, he says, you know what? This is a solution to your problem, sir. The British are asking me, I said, this is a solution to your problem, sir. See, I said, you, sir, in America, you got 7.8 million women who can't get husbands. Did you know that? If every man in America got married, there will still be 7.8 million, almost 8 million women who can't get husbands. And the manpower you have, there are 25 million sodomites. You call them gays, homosexuals. Another 25 million women can't get husbands. That makes 32 million. And your prison population, 98% are male. Do you know that, sir? Your problem is getting compounded. Islam answers your solution. If you don't listen to the solution, you simmer in your soup. I said, literally, your women folk are going to the dogs. I said, you understand my English? You understand my English? I said, literally. And nobody questioned me, what do you mean literally? I said, literally, your women folk are going to the dogs. And nobody questions me. They said, that is very strong, very harsh. Look, this is the nature of question and answers. 
you ask me about this, what does the Quran say about that? I ask you. You want to know, this is actually a criticism. You have advanced a criticism against the Islamic form of life. So now I have to hit you hard. I hit you with a sledgehammer. I'm entitled to. I said, you see, it's a solution to your problem. You have a problem. So answer. This is the answer to your problem. Thank you. Yes, Yasha. Assalamu alaikum. My question is, uh, many Muslims, including myself, believe that you don't use hikmah, which is wisdom, in your preachers and lectures. And you have proved to us that uh, all the prophets created the action. What is your message to those, including myself, who believe that you don't use hikmah in your lectures? My answer to the critic is, my brother, you show me hikmah. I want you to show the Christian says Jesus is God. Right? He said Jesus Christ is God in human form. What is Hikmah? Come on, you show me. I had a man, an alim. I was going to Cape Town for one of my lecture tours. Usually I go a week before to get things organized. And the week before on that Sunday, there was a mass meeting at the Greenpoint track. Eight alim, sheikhs, and imams of Cape Town, the giants of Cape Town, they had organized a meeting. Eight on the posters, eight on name. Sheikh Nazim, Sheikh Najjar, Sheikh so and so, Imam Abdullah Harun. Eight giants were to address the meeting. So I said, right, let me also go along and get the benefits. So I go to the Greenpoint track at about two o'clock, half past two, and I see people are walking away. I said, well, what's wrong? He says, not enough people there. Not enough people. So I said, no, man. Let me go and meet some people. So I meet, Salaam Alaikum, Mr. Didat. Salaam Alaikum. I see a big group, about 12 of them, standing around, one man. So I said, Salaam Alaikum, Salaam Alaikum, Salaam Alaikum, Mr. Didat. <laughs> the Sheikh, he was in the midst of talking about me. Actually, backbiting me. And he got caught in the act. Like in the Bible, says the woman was caught in the act. This guy got caught in the act. See, Islam alaikum wa salam. He said, Mr. D, that I was talking about you. I said, what about me? He said, no, I'm telling these people that Mr. D, that is doing a fine job. But you see, we don't like his method. I said, what method? He said, you're touching the Bible. Our method must be the Quranic method. Can you argue against that? Our method must be the Quranic method. Can you say no? It must be the biblical method. Can I say that? No. I said no. Our method must be the Quranic method. So I said now the Christians are saying that Jesus is God. What is the Quranic method? I want you to tell me now. The Christians say that Jesus is God. So what is the Quranic method? He said, no, they don't say he's God. He said, he's the begotten son of God. No, he's the son of God. I said, yes, but they say he's the begotten son of God. And the begotten son of a Malay is a Malay. That of an Indian is an Indian. That of a dog is a dog. Dog begets dogs. Cow, bulls, <laughs> cows, damn it all. So the begotten child is of its own nature. They say he's the begotten son. Begotten means whatever the person is, he begets of his kind. Indian begets Indian, Malay begets Malay. That's only natural. Zulu begets Zulu. What does the Quran say? Hmm. I said the Quran says. The Quran says. It says, "Lakat kafar al-lazina qalu inna Allah masyhud Maryam." Anyone who says that Jesus Christ, the Son of Mary, is God, is making kufr, is an act of blasphemy, treason against Allah. Waqal al Masih, but Masih said, Ya Ben Israel, O children of Israel, La Abudullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum, who is my Lord and your Lord. Inna hu man yushrik billah, whoever will associate anyone with Allah, Fakad haram Allah lil jannah, Allah will make jannah haram for them. Paradise will be forbidden for them. Wama wahun nar, and the fire of hell will be the dwelling place. Wama li zalimina min ansar, and for the wrongdoers there will be no one to help. I said, I want to see a Sheikh or an Imam. Who go and knock at an African's door and tell him, Munir, you know, you're going to go to hell. I said, why? Because you said Jesus is God. Go and tell him. That's what the Quran says, that he's going to go to hell. Go and tell him. Your African abbasses, your slave masters, go and tell him that, sir, Munir, you're going to go to hell. Is there one? 
I say, is there a sheikh or an imam who can do that? Is there a mawli or a maulana who can do that? But I said, you see, my system is also Quranic. Allah says, Udu la sabili rabbika bil Do it with hikmah, and I show you how to do it with hikmah. Talk to him, reason with him. They say, Jesus is the only begotten son. Begotten, not made. Don't make a mistake. He's not like Adam. Adam was made by God. Every dog, pig and donkey was made by Allah. Jesus is not like that. He's begotten, not made. You know what it means? Begotten means to have sex and produce. Begetting means to... S In the Bible, first chapter of Matthew. He says, and this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. And Abraham begat Isaac, I mean, had sex and produced. And Isaac begat Jacob, had sex and produced. And Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, had sex and produced. And begat, begat, begat means have sex and produce, have sex and produce. I can call you my son. I know you won't mind it. Your father hears it, I'm sure he won't mind it. If your mother hears it, she won't mind it. Say, so this old man loves my child like his own, calling my son. Better. Huh? You don't mind. I have call you my son. Would you? No. But I visit you at home. What's your name, better? What's your name? What's your name? Hashim. Kasim. Hashim. I come to a house visiting you one day in your area, and I meet you. Hashim, my son. The Arab style. Huh? We sit down. This companion of mine who don't know our relationship is asking me, is he really your son? I said, no. This young man loves me like a father, like a grandfather, father, and I call him a son. Okay? Nothing wrong. But inside I said, yes, he is my begotten son. You know the meaning changes. Do you know that? You know what I'm saying? I'm saying you're a bastard, but in a beautiful language. If I use that word, you get, you're going to react. But I said, no, he is my begotten son. So now you catch the joke. I said, what do you say, uncle? I said, no, no, I don't mean that. I don't mean that. You got me now. But I'm still telling the guy, doesn't it look like my Yusuf? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You're a bastard. That's what the Christian is saying. Jesus is the only begotten son. The only one which had sex and produced. That means he committed zina with Maryam, alayhi salam. Joseph the carpenter's wife. And even God hasn't got a right to do that. To have sex with somebody else's wife and be get a bastard child Jesus. That is what they're saying. When I told this to a Saudi, he said, then we must kill the pastors. I said, no, 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 no. He said, when they say like that, it's that right, it means we must kill the pastors. I said, no, no, don't talk to them. Learn to talk to them. And so nicely you can talk, innocently. Say, excuse me, sir. You see, you say he's the only begotten son. Begotten, not made, he said, yes. I said, in your language, sir, please explain to me. What you mean when you say begotten, not made? Please explain to me. I don't understand your language too well. You kill him with that. You kill him with that. You don't have to dirty your hands. You don't have to pull out a knife or a dagger. Nothing. Talk to him, man. Excuse me, sir. You say he's begotten, not made. What you are really trying to tell me? And Allah knows what it means. So he reacts. So, and they say that Ar Rahman, the merciful God, has begotten a son. It's the most abominable assertion. The worst swearing you can give Allah is this. The worst swearing I can give is to call you a bastard. Worst swearing. Like this, you irritate me. I'm tired. So I say, go, go, man, you're a bloody fool. So what do you do? You laugh. Say, I got the old man right, right. Huh? You prod me further. I say, go, you're a bloody ox. I say, you're a bloody goat. What do you do? You laugh. Am I right? You, know, you laugh at all. Say, old man is tired now, man. <laughs> I got him. But if I take your mother's name, it's uncle, not one more word. I'm going to lose all the respect I have for you. Am I right? Call me what you like, call me monkey, call me donkey, call me fool. But don't take my mother's name, don't take my wife's name, don't take my daughter's name. Am I right? Call me what you like. That is how much we love our mothers and sisters and wives and daughters. But we say we love Allah more than anything else. And they were swearing him the worst swearing. What do you do? What do you do? I'm asking the alims of Saudi Arabia and the Pakistani alims. Of, I say, is this not in your Quran? Allah is crying in the Quran. He said, they are saying that I have begotten a son. means had sex and produced. He did zina with Maryam and created a bastard child, Jesus. That is what it means. What do you do? Our alims and allamas. I had a tablighi young man. He always comes to pick my brains. He comes along. Yusuf, Yusuf Goga from Marysburg. So he came. He said, he wants to tap my brains. So he prodded me. So I'm asking him. I said, Yusuf, tell me who is the most hated Muslim by the Christians of South Africa? He said, you. 
hate me. I said, who is the most hated Muslim by the Jews of South Africa? He said, you, me. I'm asking, who is the most hated Muslim by the Hindus of South Africa? He said, you. No, I can't take an exception to that. What he says is true. So I said, Yusuf, you know we've got 500 masjids in the country. Do you know that? He said, yes. With 500 imams. He said, yes. There's not a single imam in the whole of South Africa who is hated by the Hindu or the Christian or the Jew. True or false? Produce me one alim that is hated by the Hindu or the Christian or the Jew. One in the 500. One, one, one. I want to go and kiss his hands. You tell me that Maulana so-and-so, he is the man who is hated by the Hindu or the Christian or the Jew. I want to go and kiss his hands. In the 500 sheikhs and imams and maulvis and maulanas and allamas in South Africa, not one is hated by the Hindu or the Christian or the Jew. That means there's something wrong with me. Must be. Huh? Something wrong with me or something wrong with them? You tell me. Something wrong with me or something wrong with them? Do you think in my old age I don't care for life? <laughs> I don't love my life? I don't love my wife and children? I want to commit suicide? Do you think, does it look like that? I'm looking for somebody to slaughter me. Hmm. No, you're not doing your job. My brother, we are, we are not doing our job. And tell the same thing to the Arabs. I say, you're not doing your job. And the Arab listens to me. Allah. That's a, that's a greatness of the Arab. If you show him, I said, you are not doing your job. Where? I said, show me one in the Arab world. I said, Allah says, they're asking me, why can't I speak Arabic? So I said, you know, I've chosen the wrong job. Me. I was a furniture salesman. I was a driver for Simplex Furniture Factory. What I'm doing is not my line, man. <laughs> I said, this is your job. Who I'm telling the Arab, this is your job. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Maryam, Fainama yassarnahu bilisanika, that we have made it, the Quran, easy for you in your own tongue. For in your tongue, not mine, I'm a Gujarati. You know, Banya Musalman, that's me. Not my language, your language. Bilisanika. What for? Salitu bashira bihil muttaqeen. That you may with it give glad tidings to the muttaqeen. I'm asking this guy in Abu Dhabi who prodded me with the question. I said, how many masjids you got in Abu Dhabi? He said, 1,000. I said, you got 1,000 imams? He said, yes. Who are they talking to? Who are they talking to? Muttaqi. To the guy who goes to the masjid for salat. He hears the khutbah and the lectures. Good news about Jannatul Firdaus. About about Sharab and Tahura, right? He said, right. He said, Allah doesn't stop there. He said, Watun zirabihi qawm al ludda. And a warning to the qawm al ludda. One job, job number one, you give good news to the muttaqi. Allah wala. And a warning to the qawm al ludda. I said, who is qawm al ludda? <laughs> I'm asking our sheikhs and maulis and maulah, who is qawm al ludda? No, no, they haven't done homework. They haven't done homework. He said, come to me. I have now addressed a letter to the Jamita Ulama. I said, look, I want to come and talk to the Alims. You Alims, I want to come and talk to you. You, all you people, I can bamboozle you, man. I'm bluffing you. Bluffing you right and left. I can do it. I said, I want to talk to you Alims. How to do Dawah and how not to do Dawah. I want to talk to you Alims. And I allow you to ask me questions. Then the Sunni Jamiat, I wrote a letter to the Sunni Jamiat. I said, look, I want to come and talk to you Alims, not outsider. If you call them, that's your business. I don't bring a single guy with me. I come to you alone. I want to talk to you. How to do dawah and how not to do dawah. Both the jamiyats. Both the jamiyats. I am prepared to go and talk to them. What for? Because I know, alhamdulillah, I have understood what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. And I can quote you Quran and the life example of the Prophet, examples after examples. And I said, now you talk. Now you ask me questions. I want you to ask me questions. I can bluff you all, but I don't know whether I can bluff the Jamiat like that. Both the Jamiat, the Sunni and the Durbandi, both. So if you have any Alim's friend, tell them, say, did that has written this letter, when are you responding? Ask your Malvi friends. All of you, if you have any Malvi friends, ask them, and say, look, did that has written letter to both the Jamiat. He is waiting for your answer. What are you guys doing? Are you afraid of this old man? 78 year old man, one man in the 40 of you. What he can do to you? There's something wrong with you, I'm telling you. If you can't face this old man, there's something wrong. Don't you think? Huh? You can't face this old man, can't listen to him? What for, man? Huh? Will I bite them? What am I doing? Here he comes with me. AK 47. <laughs> As I have come here, I want to go to him.
So with these words, I am very grateful for you, my brothers. You know that you have come, you honored me, and uh, my sisters. Everybody gets a book each. What? I think one more question. Oh, last one. This last one. Very last one. Assalamu alaikum, yes. uncle. I just wanted to know, in terms of the verse that you quoted about inviting all to the ways of uh, Allah with wisdom and beautiful preaching, what role do women play or how do the Prophet's wives uh, conduct themselves in terms of giving da'wah? What are the guidelines and how, how are women involved? Yes, what is the lady's role? Wallah, so far in our lives, we Muslims are fighting with one hand. Every other nation fights with both hands. We fight only with one hand. We need them. We need our sisters and our daughters and our mothers to do the job. And you can do a better job than what you are doing. Your neighbors. Call the ladies to your house for a cup of tea. Any excuse. You know, the birthday of the child. You know, today is a big night for us. Any excuse. Call them for your tea and kusistas, for your tea and your bhajiyas. Call them. And then open the Quran. And say, Look, do you know we believe this? And the Hindus call them to Allah. They are good people. Individually, they are a fantastic people. They are a humble people. The herd instinct is different. See, when you rouse the people, one guy can take the whole thing off, off the track. One guy can. That's what they did, one guy. In the time of our Nabi, one guy did the job. Damage. When our Nabi is commanded to preach, he invites the leaders of the Quraysh for dinner. After dinner, he stands up to deliver the message. Abu Jahl was in that group. And Abu Jahl means the father of ignorance. Jahalat ka baat. But he was no jahil. He was one of the most learned Arabs in Arabia at the time. Out of the only six, half a dozen people in the whole of Arabia who could read and write, he was one of those. Abu Jahl. But because all his knowledge couldn't make him to see the light of truth, our Nabi said he's not Abu Hikmah. That was his title. Father of wisdom. Hikmah. Our Nabi said he's not Abu Hikmah, he's Abu Jahl. So that nickname got stuck onto him. But he was no Abu Jahl. He was no Jahil. Ignorant fool. He was not. So he stood up. He sensed it. He said, you going to listen to this upstart here? Have for his doll and rice? Are you going to listen to him? Come, come, come. He scattered the people. One devil can do that. Devil. One devil. You need in the whole hall. One guy. Say, you're going to listen to this old bloody nonsense, this old man. Come, come, come. The nature of man, amazing. All like sheep and goats. You listen to that one man against your own better judgment and you're going to walk away. You know that? That's the nature of man. So they all walked away. What does our Nabi do? He invites the leaders of the Quraysh once more for dinner, minus Abu Jahl. I said, why is it that that sunnah nobody remembers? Nobody talks about that sunnah. Do you know that? Talk about Dari. Yes, Alhamdulillah. About Miswak. I use it. I use it. I use it. I'm 78 years old. Can you see? I use it. I believe in all that. But talk about Miswak. Talk about Dari. Talk about... Masha. Masha. Nobody's talking about inviting the guy home for dinner. For lunch. That's the first sunnah of the Prophet was that. He invited the Quraysh for dinner and he failed another time again for dinner. Why is it that you can't remember that sunnah? It's going to cost you something. Mm. That's why you, the beard costs you nothing. I got it so I can tell you what do you keep a beard? If you got one size, what do you make it standard size? What does it cost me? Namat Podo, Namat Podo, come on salat. What does it cost me? I was a Molly Imam, I got to do my job. So I call you, come, come on salat, come on salat. Cost me nothing. But if I invite people, I tell you, invite people for meals. Then I am set in this, put in a situation where I have to invite, I have to also do that. So that's going to cost me something. So I'd rather not talk about that. Talk about easy, daddy rako, daddy rako. You got one, mashallah, make it standard size, my son. Wa'akhirullah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah, Mr. Ijaz. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attendance. May Allah, inshallah, reward you. Assalamu alaikum. Ladies, you can pick up.